here you go. You're right there. I think my head is, my head is barely in there. Uh -huh. But you're in there. That's all that matters. Everybody just wants to see you. Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do on Sundays. You can ask questions down below the description in this video, and I pick from those each week. Uh, this video, um, pretty much every week now, has more and more and more questions, and I appreciate everyone's uh, participation in it. And I just kind of go through and pick random questions from the questions down below. Don't take it personally if I haven't answered yours. It's, it's not on purpose. Um, there's just so many. Um, but, and again, I appreciate everyone's participation in it. I put up the um, March garden checklist video you will have seen um, before, you see, uh, before you see this one. And I think it's got some pretty good answers to you know, some of the common questions that I get. Uh, if you haven't watched that video, you might want to. Because um, again, some of the questions you know, do get repeated uh, down below and those are, tend to be the ones I don't, you know, um, that, that, I, that I shy away from choosing. Uh, so let's get started. I think I picked um, 17. Uh, questions uh, this week. Uh, this coming week, I've got a video with uh, Mark Wethington at the Ralston. I've got a third video with Tony Avent over at um, uh, Plant Delights or Juniper Level Botanic Garden and mulch video, uh, wood chip video, lots of things going on. Um, so um, sh sh should be a pretty good week on the channel. Okay, somebody has... Um, artillery fungus uh, in their wood chips. So I have my wood chip pile out here on the uh, driveway. If you watched that video, uh, you will have seen that wood chip pile a couple times actually this, this past week. Um, and artillery fungus, or there's a lot of different fungus that will get on wood chips and bark mulches just in general, um, including slime molds and things like that. Um, most of them are just no big deal. It's just the natural process of that wood breaking down. Um, you know, that's just what they do. Artillery fungus will it kind of, um, um, has a little cup uh, that builds up pressure and then blows, um, has a small little explosion that sends the spores out. Um, you wouldn't want a car or anything parked near that because it will attach itself to paint. It's kind of hard to get off of things. But other than that, it's no harm to your landscape whatsoever. Um, but it can, that particular fungus can do some staining of some things that are around it. But other than that, it's just not any big deal. Um, uh, if you're using natural things in your landscape, you can expect um, a beneficial fungi uh, to follow along, some of them less attractive than others. So, no, but no big deal. Uh, I get, still get a lot of questions about planting bulbs. Yes, if you have any bulbs, crocus bulbs, daffodil bulbs, tulip bulbs, any bulbs at this point, and they're still firm, uh, stick them in the ground, uh, give them a try, stick them in a container. Uh, you need to plant them, otherwise they're just dead. Uh, but make sure they're firm. You know, you, if, at this point you may have some super soft ones in the mix. Um, make sure you dispose of those, but any of them that are firm, try to plant them. Whether they've been cold treated, not cold treated, whatever, um, I would definitely plant them. Um, somebody asked last week's video, I my breath you can see my breath in the video because I was filming it on Sunday morning and it was quite cold out here. And somebody was like, why is your house so cold? This is definitely not the inside of my house. This is a screen porch, so I was outdoors. I have a heater right here. And for whatever reason, I was too silly to turn it on uh, last Sunday. But this is not the inside of my house. <laughs> I have regular heat and regular you know, air conditioning. So, so don't, 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 don't worry. I, I'm, not, I'm not freezing over here. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody asked me. They're in zone 7A in New Jersey, and they want to plant Carolina Silverbell, which is a large shrub or a small tree. Um, or it can be tree formed into a single trunk or a multi trunk uh, special, uh, specimen. That's a uh, Halesia Carolina. Uh, they were concerned that they're on the northern edge of where that plant grows um, and wanted to know if they could put it in the full sun, and then they were on the northern edge of it. You're not actually on the northern edge of it, you're in the northern edge of its native range which is in the Southeast United States, but that plant's actually hardy up to zone four. Keep in mind, there's a lot of native plants to the Southeast United States that are quite hardy uh, into the North. And the reason for that is because the last ice age actually killed everything in the Northeast United States and uh, you know the plant material and uh, pushed it all down here into the Southeast. So there's a lot of plants that are actually, you know, clethra, um, oak leaf hydrangeas, hydrangea arborescence, a lot of southeast native plants are hardy, went well up into Canada. And it's just, you know, the, the only reason 
uh, that they're not necessarily native stands, you know, way north. It's just because, again, Ice Age, not that long ago, really. But in, compared to the Earth's age, you know, 10,000, 12,000 years ago, it wasn't very long ago that, that, that there was ice uh, in that area of the country. You know, one, one, one funny thing is everybody, I get questions about are earthworms beneficial? And then I also get questions about, you know, um, non-native plants or, in, you know, invas invasive plants invasive plants and I always kind of chuckle to myself when I get an earthworm question because earthworms are technically invasive species in the northeast because they were also killed in the last ice age. Uh, just a little interesting uh, fact um, that uh, you, you know just just it's just kind of it's just kind of interesting. Um, almost everything up there um, living thing was you know temporarily pushed back up into Appalachia and then the plant spread back out from there, but um, it's very hardy in your area, and full sun should be fine um, up in up in New Jersey. Uh, one plant source that you might want to use. This person had been studying the internet, and I have another question. You know something about us. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and do that question now. Sources for information on the internet. Be careful with internet searches. The 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 the, the websites that. There are lots of great websites, and including Wikipedia. It's kind of amazing for plant resources uh, how good Wikipedia actually is. I understand for, you know, for some things, it's, it's changeable too easily. But people that have been involved in um, Wikipedia um, for um, botany have done an incredible job with it. So Wikipedia, uh, the Missouri Botanic Gardens website is just one of the absolute best. So you can look up that Carolina Silver Bell on there. I'm guessing it's going to say it's hardy in zone four to eight, something like that. So um, um, so you can confirm what I'm saying. Uh, and a great website. The North Carolina State uh, website uh, is in, is amazing. It's right, you know, they're three, it, that university's three blocks, four blocks away from where I am right now. Great, great website. I've been doing these videos with Tony Avid at Plant Delights, and whether or not you're going to order anything from them online or not, if you're looking for perennials, information about perennials, you know, um, how well they do in your area or other areas, uh, their website's great. Um, so there are good, solid resources on the web for information, but there also just is a lot of nonsense and a lot of repeated things. That's the thing that frustrates me the most. Um, with how the internet is for my business and so many other things. It's just something gets said and then it just gets said over and over and over again. As an example of that, the Nandinas, uh, Nandina domestica, which is a terribly invasive plant, is brought to the, you know, all over, it's all over the Southeast United States. I wouldn't have to walk 20 feet past my fence into the woods back here to find, um, to find it. But it has berries through the winter and there's an example of them killing birds down in Georgia, I've told this story before. Um, down in Georgia, some birds stopped, ate the berries, and died. And so there's one example, one example, of birds being killed by Nandina berries. But that story's been told. You know, if you if you search do Nandinas kill birds, you'll get 800 responses. But it's all that same story. It's not. Um, somebody needs a second story before we start saying that Nandinas killed birds. If Nandinas killed birds, there'd be no birds in the Southeast because those that plant has well established itself here and the berries are just everywhere. The birds are smart enough for the most part not to eat them. I'll see cardinals um, occasionally on them, but not really, um, the birds are pretty smart about knowing what to eat and what not to eat. But anyway, my point is sometimes, you know, a story gets told and then it just gets told a thousand times and it's never actually fact checked in any way, shape or form. Okay, uh, let's see. Someone asked about underplanting uh, dogwood. Um, they can't get grass to grow under it. Um, really, if you have any kind of tree, understory tree, shade tree, I don't care what kind of tree it is, grass is never going to compete well with it. Uh, that's just not something that goes on in nature. Typically we have grasslands and then we have woodlands. Uh, they, they don't overlap a whole lot, um, with the exceptions of a few trees um, that, that are happy in grasslands. For the most part, they're two separate things. So you're trying to do that in your front yard, growing grass up to the base of a tree. Uh, neither one are going to be very happy uh, in that regard. So typically I would treat, you know, planting and, un, uh, you know, underplanting a dogwood, um, things that are good for dry shade, you know, cast iron plants, rhodia, hellebores, uh, hosta. 
um, you know, lots. There's, you know, any any shade thing that was that's okay in dry shade would be fine under the dogwood. And uh, uh, you might want to buy smaller pots if you're under planting a tree, just so you don't have to break that many roots while you're doing it. You can just kind of search for soft places to plant, and then the plants will take care of it from there. But you're best having the bed be out to the drip line on your trees at least. Okay. Somebody asked when to prune crepe myrtles and pruning crepe myrtles is the most controversial things and controversial thing in gardening. Um, uh, now is the time while they're dormant. Uh, typically, I just want to cut the seed heads off of them, clean them up just a bit, take off any wild limb or overlapping limbs uh, need to be dealt with, uh, cut off any suckers because of, if when you prune, doing any pruning on the top, you're going to create root suckers, so all that kind of stuff cleaned up. But now is the time to do it while they're dormant. Uh, and then you get to the controversial thing of crepe murder where people, you know, butcher them and then they end up with these weird knuckles on them. I don't care what you do with your crepe myrtle. It doesn't matter to me. Um, it's weird that um, it does look weird uh, after you cut them that many times. But I am the proud owner in this landscape that has hundreds and hundreds of different types of plants to say I have zero crepe myrtles because um, uh, I am I'm. I'm really tired of it. By this, my, my neighborhood, oaks come down and crepe myrtles go in, and uh, none of them look particularly great. I might take you guys on a tour of ugly crepe myrtles one day, just so you can see um, what urban crepe myrtles look like after a while. Okay, um, somebody asked me uh, about dahlia seed, if I have any success with dahlia seed, and I actually meant to bring a jar out here. I collected dahlia seeds in a video. Uh, in the fall. Dahlia seeds are super easy to collect, super easy to regerminate uh, in the spring, just store them dry. Uh, and I have no problem with them coming back up. And I like to collect dahlia seeds on, because my seedling dahlias end up mixing. I did also buy some in a pack, but I'm also doing some of my own. And I'll show you that in a, uh, the next seeding video I'll do, I'll show you dahlia seed that I had collected uh, in the fall. Somebody, they had, the same person had um, planted some morning glory seedlings and they're already three or four inches tall. They didn't tell me where they lived and wanted to know when to plant them. I mean, they're tender annuals, so you probably don't want to plant them until after your frost. And if they're already three to four inches high, this is one of those things I talk about, about do, seeding things too early. Um, again, I don't know where you're at. If you're way south of me, you can put them out pretty soon. But if you're, if you're not, they don't need to go out until mid-April. So in the meantime, you may have to plant them into slightly larger containers so that you don't, um, so they don't get too stretched uh, growing them close together. But again, you know, keep in mind, you don't have to plant this stuff this early just because you see some YouTuber or somebody doing it. Um, most of these things are best going in the ground after the soil temperatures above 65 degrees. And for me, that won't be, you know, until at least the third week in April. Soil thermometer is super inexpensive on Amazon. It's a great purchase, um, and I use it several times a year. Okay, let's see. Um, somebody asked about hydrangeas for hot Georgia, <laughs> you know, area that's in Georgia that's super hot. Keep in mind, you have two native hydrangeas. You've got hydrangea um, quercifolia, which is oak leaf hydrangea, and you've got uh, hydrangea arborescence, which are smooth hydrangeas, and both of them are native to your area in Georgia. So that's... Those are the two you know you can go with. And then um, hydrangea paniculatas, don't mind heat at all. I talked about paniculatas last week. But your two native hydrangeas to your state um, are, are great for um, hot summers. Um, both of them appreciate about, you know, part shade but um, in, in Georgia, but they are native. Okay, somebody asked me about top dressing a lawn. And I've seen some of these videos the lawn care channels of people putting sand out over their lawn to level it. I don't know if you're talking about leveling or you're talking about just top dressing as in like a small amount of compost uh, just to improve the soil. Um, you know, I, I don't think I'd ever go through all the time to, uh, <laughs> to do that sand thing where I see them dragging sand across their, uh, across their lawns. Those, yellow, those lawn care channels and, you know, more, more power to them. But those guys, I bet, I'd love to count. I might at some point, not to call anybody out individually, but there's probably, some of those channels are calling for people to put chemicals or something on their lawns 17, 18 times a year probably. I have no doubt that there's probably, I, I, need, I would need to go and count. I don't want to exaggerate. But I guarantee you it's 10 plus times a year they're telling you to apply chemicals 
uh, to your lawns. Um, it's, it's just kind of crazy to me. But top dressing with compost is probably a good idea um, if you have poor soil conditions. You might want to aerate you know, in the fall and then you can throw out some compost and then that compost can find those little aeration holes and probably improve the soil a bit for your lawn for your lawn that way, but I am not into the lawn thing enough that, um, you know, I'm gonna spend a whole heck of a lot of time uh, worrying about it. Okay, um, somebody has a radiance abelia that's very floppy. They've already dug it up once and tried to fix it. Uh, keep in mind that, that radiance abelia is kind of a spreading one anyway. So if it's floppy one direction, likely it was grown pot to pot in a nursery. And so it may have only had one direction that it could go. Maybe another one from another pot was spilling over into that pot so it could only go one way. Just plant it, leave it alone. You can prune that one side a bit this time of year and that will force a little growth to go the other way and then it'll balance itself out. But be careful digging things up and replanting them and digging things up and replanting them. Try to fix something. You might try to fix it until you, you'll end up loving it to death. Uh, so keep that in mind. But that's not abnormal. Um, for it to be flopped to one side. It just should be flopped to all sides. <laughs> but like, like I say, there's, uh, there's such a shortage of plant material right now that likely someone sold that one a little prematurely um, because they could. Um, you know, we, we, the market right now is that if I can get anything rooted into a container or close to rooted in a container, I can get the money for it. So there you go. Somebody's moving. They wanted to know how easy a Japanese maple is to move or propagate. Uh, or, or take rooted cuttings on. So first of all, I don't know how big this Japanese maple is. Um, so, you know, uh, that, that, that obviously has something to do. If it's, a, if it's like a blood good maple that's 25 feet tall, you probably want to leave that one behind. Uh, but if it's a little cut leaf maple uh, that hadn't been in the ground more than 10 or 12 years, it's probably fairly easy to dig it up. This would be the time to do it before it leaves out. You can just move it to a container uh, in the meantime. And, uh, they're very transplantable. You can cut back. You can cut back a little bit of the top to compensate for a little of that root damage, and you won't have any problem moving it. In terms of taking like stem cuttings off a of Japanese maple, most Japanese maples, pretty much all Japanese maples, are grafted, and so um, if you root it, it will have a very different growth habit. You can root it, but it'll have a very different growth habit than the grafted one that's in your yard currently. So um, I would just try to transplant it into a container. And, and it probably, they transplant readily. I've transplanted many of them over the years. Um, so, and, and never had, I've never had a problem with one actually. I mean, obviously there's some physical size of one that, you know, would be an impediment to that. Uh, I just answered the sources for information thing. Um, just being careful to, you know, you know, again, that Missouri, Missouri website, the NC State website, Plant Delights website, uh, Mr. Mr. Maple. I mean, you know, some of these people, are, two of those I just said are trying to sell you something. You don't have to buy them there, but they do have good information on their site. They're very experienced, experienced people, Mr. Maple and, and Plant Delights. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, somebody asked, they hear the terms winter garden and fall garden and just wanted to know, uh, what that meant, if it's some sort of like separate space, you know, for different types of gardens. No, it's just um, when I'm talking about uh, the winter garden, like at Juniper Level Botanic Garden, when I've done these uh, two videos with Tony Avent, and we're going to do another one this week. Um, in fact, you're going to see more of that garden in this third video than you have in the first two. Uh, we, I, no, what we're talking about is just picking plants. Um, having some percentage of the plants in your landscape that always look good, even in November, December, January, uh, February. Um, that's what we're talking about with w winter garden. It's just shopping for plants at different times of the year than just spring. And so you can go and I can go over to that garden. Um, I went over there yesterday with a friend and helped them do some shopping. And you can see things, you know, how they look at different times of the year by going to botanic gardens and things like that and adding something that looks good in December or January that you don't have currently in your landscape so that, you know, when that time of year rolls around. I did that video yesterday. My yard is, my, my garden is super dormant right now. But, and the plants are small because, it's, you know, you guys know this stuff is pretty new in the ground. But overall, it doesn't look bad because I have picked some things that are either blooming this time of year in the wintertime or 
you know, quite a few evergreen things or things with texture uh, that look different than other things. I've added some more conifers back in the fall. They're all tiny right now, but um, those are going to help in the future. But that's all we're talking about is making, is trying to make sure that you're shopping 12 months out of the year. Even if you're not planting 12 months out of the year, you're at least looking at what gardens look like at different times of the year in your area and adding some of those pieces that will improve how it looks 12 months out of the year. Okay. Um, somebody asked me about um, a couple of tomatoes that I really like. I really like um, cream sausage, and I'm doing that one this year and one other. It's like a white um, Roma-shaped tomato. It's kind of a medium, small to medium-sized tomato. And then they wanted to know a smaller tomato I like. Bronze Torch. I grow Bronze Torch uh, every season. It is, by to me, the best tomato I've ever had. It's bigger than a cherry, smaller than a smaller than a Roma sized tomato, but bigger than a cherry, somewhere in the middle of that size range. Beautiful tomato too. Um, it's pr pretty to look at, but just a great, great tomato. Uh, it's bronze torch. Somebody asked me when the best time, if they can divide hosta now. Yeah, as long as you can find them. You know, mine are, the few that I have in this landscape are still very dormant. Um, we're only a week or two away from me starting to see them coming up. Uh, as long as you can find them easily without damaging them, yeah, you can pop them out of the ground and divide them pretty much any time. They're so, they're so tough. Uh, I always like to do it in the fall after they've gotten a frost or a freeze and they're dying back to the ground because I can see them at that time um, and they're going into their dormancy. But you can do it now, no problem. You're not going to hurt them. Um, again, other than you're going to stab them with a shovel because you don't know where they are. Um, that you could hurt them that way. Um, so, oh, okay. Uh, I got a couple more here. Uh, somebody asked about they get they mail order plants from the south. They arrive with new growth on them. Um, I talked about that in the uh, video yesterday, the March checklist video. Uh, if you're if you're ordering plants because you you want to make sure you get them for the season, they're arriving with new growth on them. I don't put those things in the ground. Um, until closer to my uh, frost, my average last frost date. But I do keep them outside as much as possible. It's not like between now and April 15th, it's gonna be below freezing in my area. It's only gonna be below freezing maybe three, four nights the rest of the season probably. So those nights, I'll be able to bring them into the kitchen, set them in the kitchen. If it's only like 31, 32, I can just put them on this screen porch. If it's gonna be in the 20s, I'll probably put them uh, in the kitchen on some towels or something like that. Uh, the rest of the time they're outside in the sun. Um, give them sun, keep them outside as much as possible and just protect them on those few nights. Okay, and then, and then wait because they have all that new growth on them. Otherwise they will get stung. It's not the end of the world. I've gotten a mil, I mean, I don't know, not exaggerating. I've probably had 100,000 plus plants in my life leaf out in the spring and then get a frost on them that you know, basically tip prune them for me. Uh, going into spring, it's not that big of a deal. But if you just paid $40, $50, $60 for a plant, that's probably not the look you want it to have. So that's what we're talking about here. But will it kill it? Not likely unless it was really, really cold. Okay. Um, last question. Somebody asked about an orange um, um, azalea uh, in, in Georgia. I have this solar glow uh, sunbow uh, azalea back here and it will open orange it's fragrant the foliage is fantastic on it buddy lee actually introduced that it's the sunbow series from southern living plant collection not enough nurseries are growing them i wish more nurseries were growing them and one of the reasons is the foliage is so clean on it a lot of these um, native our native azaleas are um, they come out flower foliage comes out looks okay and then they get some disease problems during the season. They also have great fall color if the foliage holds up well through the summer, and a lot of times it just doesn't. So um, these also have the great fall color, great fragrance, incredible orange color, but that's the Sunbow series, Solar Glow from the Sunbow series at Southern Living Plant Collection. <laughs> Sounds like a good advertisement uh, for that thing, uh, but it's a, great, it's a great plant, and I wish more people were growing it. You might try to find that one on Plants by Mail. So there you go. Thank you guys for participating in these uh, Sunday question and answer videos. Holly is completely passed out here. I think you can see the top of her ear. 
right there. <laughs> so again, uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Uh, lots of good content, I hope, this spring. Thanks for watching.